Hello, and welcome to our webinar entitled Molecular Epidemiology Critical Applications in Public Health and Clinical Laboratories, hosted by Wiley in the American Society for Microbiology Press. I'm Ellen Fox, Managing Developmental Editor of ClinMicronaut ASM Press. ClinMicronaut recently published the new molecular epidemiology chapter from the Manual of Clinical Microbiology 13th edition in the chapter around which this webinar is based, and I'll drop a link for this chapter in the chat once we get started. We're really pleased you can join us today for this webinar on a very important and timely topic, which will review how high throughput genomic surveillance has emerged as a critical tool for infectious disease monitoring and outbreak response. Before I hand the podium over to our speakers, I want to note that you're all in listen-only mode to cut out any background noise. However, we invite you to type your questions in the question box in your control panel so the presenters can address them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. The session is being recorded and in a few days time, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Additionally, you'll find a copy of the slides in the handout section of the webinar panel. So without further ado, let me hand it over to our speakers today. Duncan McCannell, who is the Chief Science Officer with the CDC Office of Advanced Molecular Detection, Heather Carlton, Branch Chief for the CDC Enteric Diseases Lab Branch, and Nancy Chow, Team Lead for the Data and Quality with the CDC Mycotic Branches uh, Diseases Branch. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to you, Duncan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen, and uh, we're excited to be here today. Uh, to talk about molecular uh, epidemiology because it really is a field that is undergoing uh, significant transformation and change and hopefully we'll capture some of that in our seminar today. Uh, so first some definitions. Uh, molecular epidemiology lives uh, at the intersection between molecular biology, applied epidemiology, and um, applied approaches like infection control uh, where we use molecular tools to better understand the transmission uh, characteristics and the population structure sometimes of infectious diseases. Um, next slide, please. So uh, here's a brief history of some of the approaches, and it definitely is not a complete uh, history by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, as you can see, though, some of the techniques that we use are, uh, are probably older than you think. Uh, approaches like serotyping uh, have been used for almost a century, starting in the early 1900s. Uh, and over the course of that century, there was a slow but uh, steady pace of discovery and methodological refinement, uh, with new techniques introduced every few decades. And most of these early techniques, uh, they were really focused on the phenotypic properties and features of the microbes. Uh, these were usually used in conjunction with functional differences like growth on different media or uh, different antimicrobial susceptibilities, uh, but they really looked at some of the, the properties and physical properties of the, uh, the microbes that we studied. Uh, as we entered the 1970s and 1980s, uh, things began to accelerate a little bit, uh, like most of the field of molecular biology, and uh, as core techniques uh, like PCR were discovered and applied. Uh, and you saw a, an explosion of new methods, uh, and many of those methods are now genotypic in nature. Uh, we're going to talk about a few of these today, uh, specifically pulse field gel electrophoresis, or PFGE, uh, MELVA, or multi-locus variable number 10 and repeat analysis, uh, probably several flavors of MLST, or multi-locus sequence typing, uh, and uh, uh, really the balance of the, of the talk today will be about uh, whole joint genome sequencing and how we use that at scale for a lot of these applications now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another important point to get across is that uh, not all of these approaches are equal in terms of their ability to detect, uh, resolve, or distinguish between different microorganisms. And there are, are really good reasons why you might want a broad technique uh, versus something that will give you really fine-grained uh, genotypic or specific data. Uh, the appropriateness of the method really depends on your specific objectives and what you're trying to accomplish, uh, and the characteristics of the assay itself. Uh, increasingly, though, uh, sequence-based methods uh, can run this entire gamut uh, from unbiased metagenomics and metatranscriptomics, which really give you the ability to detect uh, really any virus or microorganism in a sample, uh, all the way through to uh, high-resolution deep sequencing. Uh, but as we'll see, there, there are other factors to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the characteristics to consider when choosing or evaluating a typing assay, and, and really how, how do we distinguish between these? 
Uh, the first uh, three that I want to cover are really performance metrics, things like typeability. Does the assay itself provide a useful or meaningful typing result? Does it actually give you some ability to distinguish uh, between different groups of microorganisms in a way that is meaningful and useful to, uh, to the scientific endeavor? Uh, reproducibility is another critical factor. If, uh, if a technique gives different fingerprints or different, uh, different patterns, different determinations each time it's run, uh, it isn't a reliable technique and it, it can be very difficult to use those kinds of approaches to actually consistently analyze and interpret data, especially when you're doing it across multiple labs. Uh, the discriminatory power is something that we dwell on a lot. Does the assay have the ability to di differentiate between epidemiologically related or unrelated isolates? Uh, and as we'll see, there's different levels of resolution that can be applied. And sometimes uh, you don't necessarily need to go down to the, uh, the base level uh, to really understand what's going on in, in a broader population. So as I said, these are all uh, essentially performance metrics. Uh, they give you things like the sensitivity and specificity of the assay, uh, but they're really how the assay itself performs. Uh, there are other uh, variables so that you do have to consider performance considerations. Uh, what is the cost of the assay, especially if you're running many hundreds or many thousands of samples through it? Uh, you also have to think about the throughput, uh, both in terms of how many samples can be run through an assay practically, uh, but also batch sizes and things like that, things that actually practically impact how the assay is run and where it can be run. Uh, things like staffing, both in terms of ensuring that you have the necessary staff to perform the assay and interpret the assay, uh, but that they have the appropriate training and background to actually be able to make meaningful use of the, of the data when it is generated and that they can consistently uh, maintain the high quality of, uh, of uh, quality metrics around uh, the data performance. Uh, things like logistics and turnaround time also become important, especially when you're trying to do very rapid or uh, high resolution um, uh, broad scale surveillance. Uh, and then lastly, this will, this will come up particularly when we start talking about genomic methods. Uh, is the ease of interpretation. Uh, many of these newer techniques generate massive amounts of data that require bioinformatics and scientific computing to interpret and turn into actionable data or into actionable information. Uh, there's a lot of effort and experience required to obtain that information and uh, you know that itself requires uh, investments in uh, infrastructure, IT infrastructure, laboratory infrastructure, uh, but also ensuring that the workforce uh, that is performing these assays, that's interpreting these assays, uh, that is using these data to help drive uh, public health or clinical policy uh, understands how the data can be used and linked to other pieces of information they collect. Uh, next example, please. Or next slide. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's look at some classical examples uh, that are still very widely used. Uh, the first uh, I want to consider today is a PFG or pulse field gel electrophoresis. Uh, PFG has been around since the, uh, since the 1980s, um, and it was broadly adopted in the 1990s by uh, laboratory-based surveillance programs like PulseNet, uh, where it was used to uh, type and characterize bacterial pathogens. Uh, in this technique, uh, one slide forward, please, this one's animated. There we go. Uh, scientists uh, suspend the pathogen's genomic DNA in an agarose matrix, and they cut it with one or more rare cutting enzymes. So these are uh, endonucleases that cut uh, usually a six mer uh, uh, repeat or a palindromic sequence within the, uh, the DNA. Uh, and they usually target that to chop the DNA into about 15 to 25 pieces. Uh, often scientists will cut the same uh, pathogen uh, genomic DNA with several different enzymes to help get a composite pattern, so several different patterns off the same isolate uh, that they can be combined into a single fingerprint. Uh, and these digested fingerprints are then loaded into a specialized electrophoresis system that, uh, that applies a constant voltage across the gel matrix in one direction uh, and alternating pulses uh, of voltage at 60 degree angles, which makes these large pieces of DNA sort of uh, sift through the agarose matrix uh, and separate into distinct uh, gel fingerprints, even though they're really massive pieces of DNA. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages. This is a, this is a platform that can be used. Uh, you can use similar hardware reagents and methods uh, to study many different types of bacteria and fungi. It's very discriminatory and reproducible, uh, but it is, uh, it is very hands-on. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, specialized user time. It can be relatively expensive. Uh, and as you see here, the data interpretation is very analog. You, you're, you need to basically perform image analysis uh, 
and normalization of the, those, uh, those gels between different labs in order to compare fingerprints. Um, so that makes, uh, that adds to the level of difficulty. But at the same time, it was very successfully used by PulseNet uh, and many other programs uh, that have used it for broad scale molecular surveillance uh, for decades and decades. Uh, next slide, please. So a, another technique to consider uh, is MELVA or multi locus variable number tandem repeat analysis, uh, which is a mouthful. Uh, so as I said, it, it was usually used in conjunction with PFG and it takes advantage of tandem repeats in the genome of some bacterial, uh, fungal, or even in some cases viral genomes. Uh, these regions uh, are amplified and separated uh, using a high resolution uh, capillary sequencer or fragment analyzer. And by doing that, you understand how many repeats there are at each one of these different loci. Uh, the use of tandem repeat strategies is still very widely used. Uh, and in fact, uh, even today, it's being used as a, as a potential uh, um, uh, supportive strategy for things like monkeypox uh, virus analysis. Uh, these viruses are, are big and they have uh, multiple repeat regions across their genome. And so uh, in some cases, it may not necessarily be uh, as expeditious to sequence the entire genome. Uh, but rather focus in on some of the repeat regions that, uh, that inform some of the diversity. Uh, a few advantages, it is highly discriminatory. It's more discriminatory usually than PFGE. The data format itself is easy to transmit because it is really just uh, strings of uh, copy numbers uh, within each one of the loci. Uh, but it does require specialized training and probably the biggest challenge to this practically is that there uh, were instrument to instrument differences in terms of sizing. So uh, depending on what specific hardware you were using, especially on the electrophoresis side, uh, sometimes it was difficult to make direct comparisons between labs. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and uh, bring us into the genomic age. Uh, molecular epidemiology, as we said at the top of the call, uh, is undergoing a major shift as pathogen genomics and metagenomics become increasingly feasible to use in uh, the types of scenarios and at the types of scales that we need in clinical and public health labs. Uh, our next update to the chapter um, may be pretty short. It might just be a single page with genomic sequencing written in, uh, in 80 point font, uh, but I don't think so. There's a lot of nuance here and I think uh, we're still starting to scratch the surface about, uh, about uh, how it's used. Uh, but, you know, I think it's still important to learn a lot of the classical molecular approaches and how they have informed our, our views on molecular epidemiology and what they've shown us about, uh, about pathogen evolution. Uh, and there's a few good reasons for that. First of all, uh, sequencing is not always the most uh, economical, expeditious, or practical approach. As I've said, you know, sequencing itself requires significant investments in laboratory and bioinformatic infrastructure. Uh, it is, uh, the costs have come down very significantly as we'll see in a minute, uh, but uh, the per sample cost is still often higher than, um, than other assays. You also have to think about logistics and turnaround time and what your specific objectives are. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's been decades of investment in, uh, in techniques like pulse field gel electrophoresis and other molecular methods. Uh, and that laboratory infrastructure and workforce competency are already in place and broadly available. So. Uh, often they can provide an important basis for, uh, for applying genomic methods on top of that uh, and helping with that transition. But you, you really want, often want to take advantage to the, uh, the install base and the expertise that's already in place. Uh, the other thing obviously is, you know, as you consider genomic methods, uh, looking at some of these complementary and orthogonal typing strategies can be very useful, especially uh, ones that are more phenotypic in nature or that tell you different things about the pathogen that you're studying. Uh, that said, you know, that it is a two-way street. So genomics can help inform uh, the development of tailored high throughput assays. So if you're developing uh, very specific PCR assays for a specific group of pathogens, uh, your first stop is usually looking through the genomic data that's available for the organisms of interest, near neighbors, and things that you want to exclude. Uh, likewise, though, you know, you can actually use historical typing strategies. I gave you the example of MELVA as one, uh, but they can be used to help inform, uh, you know, how you might approach uh, genomics or you, uh, genomic or bioinformatic methods. 
uh, more broadly as you as you move towards the future. Um, all that said, you know, I think there is uh, increasing convergence towards sequence-based methods. Uh, we'll talk about in a minute why that's uh, that's an exciting possibility. Uh, and I think the onus really on, on public health in the near term is to ensure that uh, these approaches are more universally available, that they are locally sustainable, and that uh, laboratories all over the world are able to uh, generate, participate, and use and share these kinds of data. Uh, next slide. Uh, so why has genomics been so transformative? I, I think almost any slide that talks about the, uh, the changes in the genomic field uh, use some derivative of this, uh, this graph, which uh, really charts the impact or the, the change in cost uh, for a megabase of sequence, generation of a megabase of sequence data. Uh, throughout uh, most of the last century, up until the mid uh, early 2000s, uh, sequencing of a megabase of gene of DNA, so you know your average bacterial genome is uh, somewhere in the three to five megabase range, uh, was uh, still you know thousands of dollars to, to complete at, at even a draft level. Uh, since uh, 2001, though, we've seen a six order magnitude decrease in the in the cost of sequencing. Uh, as these platforms have become more uh, more ubiquitous and more um, more widely available, uh, this technology advancement uh, has been absolutely transformative, and it has moved sequencing from uh, a second line or specialized technique to something that is much more practical to use as a frontline approach. Uh, and you'll, as you'll see, the the scale at which it's been applied, uh, especially in recent years, has been absolutely astron uh, astronomical. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why is sequencing uh, exciting? Um, I think to understand this really fully, you need to look at the inputs and outputs of the sequencing uh, process. Uh, in terms of inputs, uh, it, it draws on DNA or RNA, which can be from a variety of different sources. So it could be a genomic sequence data for, or amplicon sequence data, or sorry, amplicon sequence, a uh, whole sample sequence, or if you were actually uh, sequencing uh, an environmental or clinical sample and applying metagenomics to that. Uh, and the advantage is, you know, that, you know, DNA, RNA are, are, are pretty universal, so are, are universal. So, you know, these can be drawn from hosts, they can be drawn from vector, they can be drawn from pathogen, the environment, or a mixture of all four of those. And you can use a lot of the same instrumentation, a lot of the same expertise to have multiple lines of inquiry. Uh, the other piece is that there's a lot of different things you can do with sequence data when you get it, uh, ranging from uh, comparative genomics, uh, identification, high-resolution strain typing, which is a lot of what we're talking about today. Uh, but you can also look for specific features or characteristics. You can uh, you can use it to develop reference sets. Uh, you can look at minor populations within uh, individuals or within populations uh, and understand um, better some of this, the host pathogen interface, how that, how that plays out. Uh, metagenomics, we're not going to touch on that a lot today, but there's a lot of ways in which that's being used, um, both for pathogen discovery and identification. So these techniques are broad scale enough that they can be used, uh, even if you don't necessarily know the specific pathogen uh, affecting uh, a sample or individual. Uh, but they're also ap applicable in cases where we do. Uh, you know, a lot of the clinical diagnostic realm is moving towards uh, more uh, panel-based uh, culture-independent diagnostic testing, which is really good <clears throat> for individual patients. Uh, but it is challenging for us to generate the, the necessary data for, uh, for broad-scale uh, pathogen or public health use. So metagenomics may be a, a strategy there. Uh, and then a lot of infectious diseases that we study uh, have an important um, uh, uh, microbial ecology, microbial population basis to them. Uh, things like uh, cluster dioides difficile, for example. Uh, as I've said earlier, a lot of the challenges are in the middle part here, and this is where we continue to do a lot of work. Um, there's been a lot of advancements in uh, sequencing instrumentation and kits and consumables. Uh, the bioinformatics uh, itself uh, continues to evolve, and a lot of the methods continue to be refined. Uh, but, uh, you know, making sure that those are as standardized as possible, that they are uh, widely applicable as possible, that they can be performed in multiple labs continues to be uh, an ongoing challenge. Um, next slide, please. Uh, that said, you know, the expansion of, of sequencing has been uh, pretty dramatic over the course, over the uh, scope of the, the U.S. public health system. Uh, going back to 2013, there really were only six or seven uh, public health labs around the uh, the United States that had sequencing capacity. Uh, a lot of these were from initial investments by uh, FDA Genome Tracker and uh, PulseNet USA. Uh, 
Uh, and over the course of the next five years, uh, sequencing capability came to all 50 state public health labs. Uh, again, a lot of this was driven by foodborne disease surveillance, but once that, cap that capability was there, um, a these approaches were started and were used for uh, local priorities within these states. Uh, things like influenza surveillance and healthcare associated infections, uh, viral hepatitis, legionella, tuberculosis, just to name a few. Uh, we're going to sh shift gears now. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Heather Carlton, and she's going to talk about uh, PulseNet and how uh, PulseNet has used uh, sequencing as an approach and uh, how it continues to use it in the future. Great, thanks, Duncan. Um, so if you're not familiar with PulseNet, PulseNet is a national laboratory network that connects foodborne, waterborne, and one health-related illnesses to cases to detect potential outbreaks. Next slide, please. And just a little history about how we go from an ill patient to sequence data in our, our PulseNet database is it starts with an ill patient. Um, click please. They go to their doctor and a sample is collected. Next slide, or next click. That sample is then sent to a clinical lab where the pathogen is identified. Click please. And the different pathogens we track as part of PulseNet include Salmonella, Shigatoxin producing E. coli, Listeria monocytogenes, Campylobacter, um, Vibrio, and Chronobacter. Um, and if the isolate belongs to to any of those pathogens, then that isolate is forwarded to a public health lab. Next slide, please. At the public health lab, molecular subtyping is performed. And that data, now whole genome sequence data, is then uploaded to a national PulseNet database um, where potential matches are identified to identify um, outbreaks. Next slide. So PulseNet is a, a laboratory network that is in all 50 states. So all state public health labs are part of PulseNet, as well as some of the larger um, city and county jurisdictions and federal partner labs, including FSIS at USDA and FDA are part of our, our network. And all of these labs generate sequence data from the different pathogens that PulseNet tracks. And then they transmit that sequence data to a centralized database at CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. PulseNet then goes in and monitors for clusters of illness with that same molecular fingerprint. Uh, and once we identify those illness clusters or potential outbreaks, we then work with our epidemiologists to investigate um, the source of the potential outbreak. Next slide, please. PulseNet has been around for um, nearly 26 years now, and started out using the technique that um, Duncan discussed, Pulpefield gel electrophoresis. And then in 2013, with the help of um, our advanced molecular detection program, we started transitioning our subtyping methods to whole genome sequencing and finished that transition in 2019. And currently we submit about 55 to 65,000 genomes to NCBI annually. And the reason we transitioned to whole genome sequencing is we can detect outbreaks with more precision and have more effective outbreak investigations and trace back. Next slide. And one of our primary methods we use as part of PulseNet is multi-locus sequence typing. And um, as Duncan alluded to, there's a few different flavors of that. We use whole genome and core genome multi-locus sequence typing. So if you're not familiar with multi-locus sequence typing or MLST, um, some key definitions for the method include locus, which is an open reading frame. Um, can you click, please? And locus generally can, um, is a, a gene, so it would have a start and stop codon. Um, Click, please. And I think one more. Yep. And then an allele for that locus is going to be a specific gene sequence at that locus. And you can see here in the example in green, um, these are all the same loci. And then that bottom example has a nucleotide difference. So it would get a different allele number for that locus. 
And then a scheme is a set of loci and alleles um, that are included in the strain typing definition. So schemes are usually defined um, as the genus or species of the, the organism that you're subtyping. Um, and then nomenclature is a standardized way of referring to allele loci in sequence types. So calling it allele number one or two is just a standardized way of communicating about it. And then curation for these databases means obtain updating and maintaining the allele database for a given genus species based on established criteria. And there are um, publicly available whole genome and core genome MLST schemes, um, including ones that are available for through pubmlst.org, as well as software that's available for doing this type of analysis and examples listed below. The advantages of using this type of approach is it's discriminatory, reproducible, and re results in a consistent hierarchical nomenclature. So you'll always name the number one allele the same thing, um, no matter um, how many times you, you find it in a genome. And uh, the data are reasonably portable um, because there, there are these publicly available schemes. We can all use the same kind of scheme or, or dictionary for how we call our alleles. Um, this method may be slightly less discriminatory than other methods, including um, single, nucleotide, single nucleotide polymorphism analysis. Uh, and there is some computational cost for doing these analyses, but overall it's very powerful and reproducible. Um, click, please. And one more time, I think. Couple more, please. Yeah, and then you can use the allele numbers to generate a phylogenetic tree to determine relatedness. Next slide, please. And just for another um, part of the terminology, we also use core genome MLST. And core genome is those genes that are in common in over 95% of the isolates analyzed for a single genus and species. And usually the core is 50 to 80% of the total genes found in an organism genome. So for example, for Listeria, they usually have about 3,000 genes per genome and approximately 1,748 of those genes are considered core. So around 60, 70% is core genome MLST. And then the accessory genes are those that are found in a few strains. So they're not considered to be part of the core. And when we talk about whole genome MLST, we're usually referring to the accessory plus the core genome. And for our surveillance analysis, so the, the analyses we do to detect outbreaks, core genome is the method we commonly use. And it, we use it to quickly find closely related isolates in a diverse data set. So as I mentioned before, um, we generate about 65,000 genomes per year. Um, and about 50,000 of those will be salmonella. And during the summer months, when we have a, a lot of salmonella outbreaks going on, it, we get um, 100, 100 genomes per week, 100 or more genomes per week. So it's good to have a, a method that we can um, quickly survey our, our data set to see if there's any potential outbreaks going on using this core genome MLST. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about a few examples of um, applying whole genome sequencing and core genome MLST um, to some outbreaks and compare it with the previous technique we use called field gel electrophoresis. So in this example here, this is a Listeria monocytogenes outbreak associated with Qi that was detected in 2013 when we started our transition to whole genome sequencing. In the tree you see here, red are the epi-related clinical cases that were detected as part of the outbreak. <clears throat> and then in blue are historical isolates from cases. And these are isolates with the same PFG pattern. And actually this whole tree um, is made up of genomes of the same PFG pattern. Uh, the little cheese wedge represents environmental isolates and that blue box is around closely genetically related isolates. So with PFGE, um, it didn't provide the level of resolution we needed to, you know, correctly group together 
uh, outbreak isolates with potential environmental sources. But when we were able to apply whole genome sequencing, we were able to closely link those um, epi-related clinical cases with the environmental samples, and then a couple historical isolates as well. So we're able to, to, more, to better identify potential sources of outbreaks um, and more rapidly. And when we implemented whole genome sequencing as our primary method for detecting listeria outbreaks, we were actually able to detect listeria outbreaks with fewer cases. Um, because we were able to make those links sooner to identify what could be the cause of the outbreak. So it's been a really powerful technique for um, our PulseNet network. Next slide, please. And um, this is another example of how whole genome sequencing was able to solve a cluster or break up a cluster that, that PFG identified. And this is another example from when we started Whole genome sequencing in PulseNet. Um, and it was a, a potential cluster associated with uncommon deli meat. So you can see on the epi curve on the bottom, the cases are signified by those bars there. And there was, you know, slight increases in this PFG pattern in cases over a two-year period, so 2012 and 2013. Um, and all uh, majority of the cases reported eating these um, uncommon deli meats, and some of the examples are listed here. So when we went on to do whole genome sequencing, uh, next slide, please. You're able to see by whole genome sequencing what we thought were, could be a, an outbreak, actually wasn't. So the cases were broken up to have um, several genetic differences between those isolates and really told us that this wasn't an outbreak, whereas by, by PFGE, we thought it was. So you can see, you know, in the progression of time with new molecular epidemiology techniques, um, what benefits that can have to detecting outbreaks in a, a molecular surveillance network. Next slide, please. And as we started to do whole genome sequencing, we already, we also started to emerge these or identify these trends um, that are called reoccurring, emerging, and persisting strains that we couldn't identify with PFGE because in some cases, PFGE just didn't provide enough discrimination for us to, to really see these trends. So reoccurring are those strains that uh, occur periodically with a substantial number of illnesses and are typically identified as outbreaks year after year. Um, emerging strains are those strains that we see um, increase in frequency, and then persisting strains are those strains that cause illnesses consistently over time with some fluctuation. Next slide, please. And there's actually several examples of how whole genome sequencing has helped us identify these persisting strains, including listeria linked to ice cream, over 10, over five years in 10 cases, listeria linked to soft cheeses um, in frozen vegetables, as well as salmonella newport infections in ground beef, salmonella redding linked to turkey products, and salmonella infantis linked to chicken products. You can really see these trends just continuing over years, which really means that we're, we weren't able to find you know, the, the source of contamination um, and really, we're looking to whole genome sequencing to help us um, understand this better. Next slide, please. So how we identify these strains are from outbreak investigations, identifying pathogens in food production environments or growing regions, and searching our databases for groups of genetically related clinical isolates. Next slide, please. And really why we're interested in this and why whole genome sequencing is such a powerful tool for our PulseNet surveillance is in PulseNet, 10% um, of the isolates are part of an outbreak. So if we're talking about 65,000 isolates um, that we sequence per year, only 6,500 are gonna be identified as part of an outbreak. And only a, a portion of those will be identified, um, will have the, the source of the outbreak identified. So by looking at these rep strains, um, which represent more of our, our databases, we can possibly drive down the incidence of foodborne pathogens for that other 90%. Next slide, please. And we continue to um, 
look at repeated ongoing identification of the same strain, suggesting that there's this upstream contributor or reservoir. And you know, when I was talking about persisting strains, you know, we see this kind of continual low level um, of illnesses caused by these strains. We're obviously missing something in what's contributing to this illness. So we can really have an impact by, by understanding this better. Um, our traditional outbreak control me measures such as product recalls may fail to address these underlying contributors. And so additional investigative approaches are needed for these strains beyond what we use in typical outbreak investigation. Next slide, please. And now I'm just gonna walk you through an example of a rep strain. So this is a reoccurring strain. STECO 157 H7 in the outbreaks that we identified over years were often linked to leafy greens, um, particularly California grown lettuce. And here's just an example from 2016 to 2020 of the different outbreaks we detected due to the strain, um, as well as additional trace back information if this is available. Next slide, please. And this is a core genome MLST minimum spanning tree. So the, we have about 400 um, clinical and environmental isolates in this tree, and they all are within eight allele differences from each other. So it, they're all closely genetically related. Um, click through, please. And you can see by the colors, you have some groupings based on source as well. Next slide, please. And when we looked further into the data set, we identified a couple genetic subclusters, subcluster one and subcluster two, by which by whole genome sequence information, we were able to um, directly link to growing regions in California, including Santa Maria, which was our subcluster one, and Salinas, which was our subcluster two, as well as um, environmental samples from those regions as well. So whole genome sequencing has been really powerful in the PulseNet network. Um, helping us identify outbreaks faster with fewer cases, as well as um, identifying trends in our, our data, including these recurring, emerging, and persisting strains. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to hand it over to Nancy. Thanks, Heather. Okay, so for the next little bit, I'll talk about how we can use pathogen genomics uh, for tracking emergence and geographic spread of public health threats. And one really great example of this is a fungal threat. Uh, this is a fungus said to have quietly swept the globe, appearing in healthcare settings um, in over 40 countries now. It goes by the name of Canada Oris. This is an MDRO or C. Oris, and it is listed, CDC is listed as the top urgent AR or antimicrobial resistant threat and CORS is concerning for a number of reasons. Um, here we have four. The first is we know that patients can become colonized on the skin and that this can go on and develop into an invasive life-threatening infection. We see about five to 10 per, uh, percent of persons who are colonized developing invasive infections and mortality rates are high, anywhere from 30 to 40 percent. The second reason CORS is concerning is it's resistant to commonly used disinfectants. So we have a longstanding relationship with the EPA where we work to maintain a list of disinfectants that are effective against CORS. Uh, and we know that commonly used ones, um, sometimes considered the holy grail of disinfectants in healthcare settings like the quaternary ammonias, those are not effective against CORS. So another concern there. The third is CR spreads in healthcare settings and it can spread rapidly. Um, and it's a lot to do with the fact that there's colonization, that it's hard to, to properly erase it or you know, disinfect um, surfaces in the healthcare setting. And so with CORS, for the first time for a fungal pathogen, we really have to think about person-to-person -person transmission, that type of spread in healthcare settings for a fungal pathogen. Uh, and then last, and perhaps maybe the most concerning, is CORS is highly drug resistant. Uh, we see extremely high rates of drug resistance with CORS. Uh, we always like to emphasize that for antifungal drugs, there's not a lot of options out there for invasive infections. There's only three classes, 
The first, the azoles, um, seahorse at this point, we consider it almost intrinsically resistant to azoles with 90 to 95% resistance. The second class, polyenes, we see about a third of strains resistant to that. And then the third class, echinocandins, this is considered first-line therapy in many countries. We, don't, we see about 1% resistance, so you know that's, that's great, but we do see rising rates with that. And there are instances of PAN resistance, where that's resistance to all three antifungal classes of drugs. So in terms of the molecular epidemiology, uh, there are distinct COR strains, and we, we often refer to these as the major clades. And you can see here, these are the clades labeled one through five, and they're really based on um, the geographic origin of the cases that were used to first describe the clade. So for example, here with clade four, uh, outbreaks in Venezuela were happening. And when we looked at the cases, when we took the isolate, whole genome sequenced it, we found that that clade, um, that strain was genetically distinct, let's say from cases in South Africa or Indian Pakistan or, or Japan. And there's a lot of phylogeographic structure, strong phylogeographic structure, where in the case of clade four, when we also look at cases from outbreaks in Colombia or Panama, those cases are more genetically similar. They're clustering to clade four than let's say um, clade three, two, or one. Uh, most recently, we identified clade five from some cases in Iran. So that's sort of the molecular epi of what we see globally. And then when we look at you know, the tree, this is, this is how you can see it, um, and you look at the scale, these clades are really different from one another. So we're seeing tens to hundreds of thousands of SNPs different. Um, and that can be up to about 1% of the genome. Sewers has um, 12 million base pairs about. And then when you zoom in and sort of look within the clades, we still see a fair amount of genetic diversity and we still also see a lot of strong phylogeographic structure there. So Sewers lends itself really well to molecular epi. Um, so the two examples that I'm going to kind of go into more detail about how we've used it for, for tracking emergence and geographic spread, they're both in the United States. And here I just wanted to show first an epi curve of what we've seen over the last few, year, few years. So the first reported CORS case in the United States was in 2016. We did find some retrospective cases, um, you know, before, but then you know, moving forward, you can see some spikes happening in 2017, 2018, another rise around 2020. You can see in this map, these are all the case, uh, the states that are currently reporting seahorse cases as of now. So it's kind of the epidemiology of seahorse in the U.S. And so one of the first times that we used this technology, and it really helped kind of change um, the investigation, the public health investigation, was in 2017 where we started to see outbreaks of sea oris in New York and New Jersey area. And, you know, one of the first questions we asked is, we, we, we predict that there's transmission from what we had seen within the states, but was there transmission between the states? Because for a lot of these healthcare facilities in New York and New Jersey, they were really close to one another, sometimes, you know, 20, 30 miles from each other. And so the question was, are there patients that are having uh, transfers where they're staying in a different healthcare facility between the states, or is there a healthcare provider that's providing care in two different uh, facilities in, in, in the different states? So when we sequenced um, the, the genomes of these cases, we saw that the New York cases were a distinct cluster, you can see here in green, from the New Jersey cases in pink. And then if you look at the principal component analysis to the right, you can see that even, even clearer. And so this really shifted the investigation where we were confident enough for public health investigators in New York and New Jersey, um, where we could encourage them to focus efforts within their states and not really to think about transmission between their states. So a really nice example of how we use this data. The second example, uh, this is more recent, last year uh, concerning some clusters in Texas in the DC area where we started to see transmission at the time we really didn't know for sure if it was transmission the transmission of pan resistant any kind of candin resistant seahorse so if you remember the kind of candins that's that class that's considered first line therapy 
Uh, in the U.S., uh, we don't see a lot of resistance, about 1%, but it is rising. And typically, when we see a kind of candid resistance, that's when we're really concerned about can resistance, because that can be um, you know, more likely in the backdrop of azole and polyene resistance. So for these two clusters in Texas and the D.C. area, they were happening in early 2021, and things seemed pretty usual about these um, clusters in terms of C. auris, uh, in terms of the risk factors that we saw for many of the patients, uh, the types of healthcare facilities that were involved, these long-term care settings. The unique thing is that there was no known previous echinocandin exposure for these patients. So um, it wasn't reported that they had received echinocandins in their treatment. And, you know, um, this was something that we wondered, well, is it just not, we don't have it in the epi data? Is it not available? Like, is this really happening? And is this suggestive of, of transmission? Um, and, and so that was one of the first questions. The second question was, well, so these clusters are happening pretty much at the exact same time around the January to April time. And they're very, uh, very um, just distinct geographically. So are these clusters appearing simultaneously and independently? Or are there epi links that we just don't know about? Because at the point, we didn't have any epi links that would connect these two clusters. So again, are there patient transfers happening? Are there healthcare providers that are maybe working in the same jurisdictions? Are these connected, basically? And when we did sequence this, what we found is that, well, first, the genomic data does support simultaneous and independent emergence in these Texas and D.C. clusters. So you can see the Texas cases in brown, they're clustering in a distinct cluster from the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area in blue, yellow, and pink. And so that was kind of the first thought that, all right, these really do seem to be independent. And that's a question of itself, how that just kind of simultaneously appeared. Um, and that's another thing to kind of um, talk about with CORS in the way that it is sometimes with that. Um, but then also when we zoomed into the Texas strains and we, we looked at um, the, 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 the layout of susceptible and then resistant strains. So you can see here in green, those are the susceptible ones. So um, they are responsive to echinocandins. And then the resistant, pan-resistant are in red below. And we saw a distinct cluster there. So this was against evidence supporting the idea that there was transmission of echinocandin in pan-resistant strains. Uh, and you know, this didn't just shift this investigation, but really almost our entire CORS response in general, because now we could need it to communicate out that we can see transmission of pan-resistant strains. And these are really scary strains because at this point, the type of treatment that you would be thinking about is experimental treatment. So um, something that in terms of um, uh, really emphasizing vigilance to infection prevention control strategies, this was really important. So. Those are two examples of how we've used this data to track emergence and geographic spread. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Duncan uh, for another use case example in genomic surveillance. Thanks, Nancy. So uh, I think uh, just to close things out, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, the applications of uh, genomic epidemiology and surveillance uh, in, the case, in the context of a pandemic. Uh, and uh, how it's been used over the past few years. Uh, next slide, please. So the scale of, uh, of the genomic response to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2 really has been unprecedented. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has become rapidly become the most widely characterized and sequenced uh, pathogen in human history. And uh, as of today, there are over 12 million SARS-CoV-2 genomic sequences that have been sequenced and shared by hundreds, uh, if not thousands of laboratories all over the world. Uh, and that includes, uh, this slide's a little bit old, but uh, around 4 million sequences from uh, various U.S. labs. Uh, in the United States, this has been a remarkable collaboration between uh, federal laboratories and surveillance programs, uh, state, local, territorial, and tribal public health, uh, academic and clinical laboratories, and uh, many private sector laboratories from all over the country. Uh, next slide. So these data are used in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, here is a, a view of the CDC's COVID data tracker, uh, and this shows regional trends of SARS-CoV-2 variants around the country. 
Uh, this is based on uh, tens of thousands of sequences that are gathered each week. Uh, and these data are used for uh, risk assessment of new variants and to help uh, guide uh, federal public health responses. Uh, and to, to, to provide ongoing uh, data to ensure that uh, the diagnostics and vaccines and therapeutics still work as expected and that are, they're prioritized as, as needed. And, uh, and also to help drive uh, some of the applied uh, uh, research priorities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the openness of the data has really helped drive uh, the development of some incredible new tools for sequence analysis, comparison, and visualization. Uh, so this is uh, NextStrain, which should be familiar to, uh, to many in the audience. Uh, and it's showing subsample data from uh, GISAID uh, from the past uh, six months. Uh, this platform brings together phylogenomic data with uh, geography and time and place. Uh, to really help understand transmission patterns. And it's been a truly critical tool that has helped made, uh, make these patterns more visible uh, and to help uh, understand and more importantly, to communicate to decision makers and, uh, and various uh, you know, people with various backgrounds, uh, what is going on and what we're actually seeing in the genomic data. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this example is uh, Taxonium and cov 2 tree from uh, Theo Sanderson. Uh, it draws on open sequence data from uh, NCBI, EBI, and DDBJ, and it builds a tree with almost 6 million sequences, which is really almost difficult to fathom uh, because it is a, a remarkable accomplishment. Um, SARS-CoV-2, as I said, has really rapidly become one of the most heavily sequenced pathogens uh, in, in history, and we now have so much sequence data that to, sort of, to try and look at it all uh, actually usually breaks uh, a lot of our usual Bayesian phylogenetic methods. So tool development uh, and algorithmic development and innovation over the past few years has been simply remarkable and critical, and I think uh, will pay dividends across the field as we move forward. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but uh, so these data are also really important at a local level, and that's where the impact of uh, genomic epi and surveillance are often felt the most. Uh, they can be critical to help focus and prioritize public health resources and uh, ideally to, uh, to use these data effectively to help keep communities healthy and safe. Uh, this is an example from uh, Leonard et al. Um, uh, EID paper from last year. Uh, and they've looked at uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmission dynamics uh, across a range of different high density uh, settings. So uh, um, um, crowded workplaces, uh, healthcare settings and correctional institutions and the like. Uh, in this example, they found an ongoing uh, outbreak in a long-term care facility uh, and a seemingly related cluster in a nearby correctional facility. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the two seemed to be uh, phylogenetically linked, but it really wasn't until the epi investigators and contact tracers dug in uh, and uh, discovered that there was actually a linkage between these, uh, these cases. Uh, there was a household, at least one household, where uh, one of the adults worked in long-term care and the other worked at the correctional facility. Uh, this isn't a smoking gun, obviously, but it shows how these data, uh, particularly when they are available quickly, can help local responders figure out what might be going on and how to focus their, uh, their interventions and their efforts. Uh, next slide, please. So what has all of this uh, shown us about sustainable method models for uh, genomic epidemiology and surveillance? Uh, for one thing, uh, it has shown us the importance uh, of building strong, uh, sustainable capacity for sequencing uh, bioinformatics and epidemiology, which I've sort of shown here in gray. Uh, that, you know, sequencing is often the easiest part of the equation to solve. Uh, and uh, as we've uh, progressed through the pandemic, that's, uh, we've seen sequencing and analysis occur in laboratories all over the world. Uh, what we can do, though, is it'd be better at connecting these efforts uh, with, uh, to help inform public health responses at all levels. Uh, and then we have to do a little bit of a better job at tying all this data generation and uh, collaboration to help drive uh, research and innovation, which you know, we've already seen start to explode from the, the data and efforts that have, have been gathered to date. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other piece, oh, sorry. <laughs> the other piece is, uh, we can use the same sorts of tools and the same sort of testing infrastructure to pull in data from patients, from wastewater, from environmental data, uh, and from things like One Health and agricultural sources. This is something that we've been doing historically in public health for a long time uh, in places like food safety. 
Uh, but, you know, we can start thinking more broadly beyond single groups of pathogens or specific applications uh, and look at approaches that really are, uh, are much more universally applicable. Uh, sorry, next slide now. All right, I, I, and I've broken this out a little bit. It's wordy and there's a lot of concepts that are thrown out here, but uh, really I want to highlight that there are some common challenges that we face across this whole spectrum. Uh, and the important thing to realize is that many of these challenges are very universal. They're shared across many different pathogens and contexts, and most importantly, they're challenges that are shared by virtually every laboratory, every public health program in the world right now, uh, from uh, Nebraska to Nigeria. And there is a tremendous opportunity for global collaboration and uh, uh, cooperation and uh, equitable collaboration uh, to solve them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so. To, how do we start to solve these? Uh, I think we end on uh, on some uh, perhaps a call to action. Uh, right now, uh, the AMD program has a, uh, a pathogenomic centers of excellence that is uh, that has been uh, solicited, and we're in the process of uh, or they're in the process of making a selection now with an anticipated launch uh, in the fall of 2022. Uh, what we're trying to do is really build stronger foundations and bridges between academia and public health to help drive this innovation, to help expand. Uh, the public health expert workforce and to help uh, us globally build a much more robust and capable genomic epi uh, capability uh, worldwide. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the ways that we've done this in the past has been through fellowship programs and in uh, engaging with, uh, with young scientists that are early on in their career that perhaps haven't considered a public health uh, role that are interested in genomic and molecular epi. Uh, and uh, expose them to public health careers. Uh, this is a slide from uh, uh, the CDC's uh, APHL uh, Bioinformatics Fellowship Program, which uh, uh, has uh, been very successful in placing uh, postmasters, postdoctoral fellows in state, local, and federal public health labs uh, around the country, and uh, has uh, really helped move the field in a lot of different domains. Uh, and then lastly, we have a new fellowship program that I'm going to hand over to, to Nancy to talk about that we're yeah. very excited about as well. I'm Thank sorry, you. this is Ellen, not to interrupt. We have to start wrapping it up. Okay. Of course. This is our last slide. We're good. Oh, great. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, so I'll just say that the Molecular Epidemiology Fellowship, uh, working at the intersection of laboratory science and epi, uh, this is new and uh, it is open uh, soon for, for fellows that will join 2023. So if you'd like to hear more about it, here's the email address. And this is really for people who have a genomics background and want a training in epidemiology, uh, applied molecular epi to, to further work at that intersection. And we will end it with uh, questions. Thank you. So we're getting close to time. So I want to thank our three speakers for excellent information that they presented. And thank you to the audience for attending and taking the time to join us today. Just a reminder, the recording of the presentation will be emailed to you within a few days. And unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we're not going to be able to take any questions. Um, but thank you again for everybody joining us today and have an excellent day.